The problem is never the drugs. The coke or the heroin is never really the problem. They're the symptom of the problem. And the problem is always about your relationship with self. In case anybody needed reminding, Scotland has the worst drug death rate in Europe. More than 1,200 people died of drug misuse in Scotland in 2019. There's been a record number of drug deaths in Scotland for the past six years in a row. And those figures in 2019, the most recent stats we have, are the highest they've ever been. The mainstream approach to tackling drug addiction in Scotland is failing miserably and at a huge cost to families. In this week's episode, we speak to two drug addiction experts who insist that the system is failing because we're not tackling the root cause of addiction. We are also going to look closely at a plant medicine that has shown remarkable success for treating drug addiction and helping people break free from their addiction and rebuild their lives. This plant medicine is called Ibogaine and yes, just like the other plant medicines we've covered in recent weeks, it's illegal as well. Addiction is not a choice that anybody makes, it's not a moral failure, it's not an ethical lapse, it's not a weakness of character, it's not a failure of will, it's just how our society depicts addiction, nor is it an inherited brain disease, which is how the medical tendency is to see it, but it actually is it's a response to human suffering. And all these people that I worked with have been severely traumatized as children, all the women have been sexually abused. All the men had been uh, traumatized, some of them sexually, physically, emotionally neglected. Not only is that my perspective, it's also what the scientific and research literature shows. So addiction then is actually, rather than being a disease as such or a human choice, it actually is it's an attempt to escape suffering temporarily. Addictions are a response to suffering and that what people need in response to addiction is not judgment and not simply symptom control, they need to be helped to heal from their trauma, because it is all about trauma. Iboga is the root bark of a bush which grows in Central Africa, and the ibogaine alkaloid is the primary psychoactive ingredient which is derived from this plant. This substance is a very powerful entheogen, which means generating the divine within and it's the chemical substance used in a religious, shamanic or spiritual context. Ibogaine often induces psychological and physiological changes, sparking intense introspection and interrupting addiction. It has long been regarded as a rite of passage and spiritual catalyst by the Gabon people, who follow the African traditions of Buiti. Ibogaine has increasingly been used as a detox treatment from many substances including heroin, cocaine, crack cocaine, morphine and even alcohol. However, this psychedelic medicine is banned in most countries, including the UK and the US. Anders Beatty is an addiction counsellor based in London who was addicted to hard drugs for 25 years and he finally broke free from the jaws of crack cocaine through an ibogaine experience. As a qualified psychotherapist, Anders has been working hand in hand with some of the world's leading ibogaine treatment centres for years now. And this involves preparing people before their ibogaine experiences and counselling them afterwards, which is crucial in order for people to integrate what they've learned on their psycho-spiritual ibogaine journeys and then properly address their root cause addiction issues. I'm trained as a integrative psychotherapist but I, I suppose that's the least of my qualifications. Um, I would say that my major qualification, well one of my major qualifications to be doing the work that I'm doing is that I was in heavy heavy addiction for, for you know two and a half decades 
Um, and, you know, within that period, I tried every modality of recovery out there, or so I thought at the time, from, um, you know, changing towns to changing countries to changing continents to run away from myself to changing relationships to changing jobs, thinking that would be the answer. Um, and then as things got progressively worse, I found myself going to detoxes and rehabs and doing the 12 steps and none of these sort of modalities of recovery worked for me. Um, I still felt an incredible sense of shame uh, for who I was and I kept, you know, using on that sense of shame. So I suppose that's one qualification. And the major qualification is that um, I kind of got my life back together, started liking who I was started creating a, a narrative of myself um, and that's because of plant medicines uh, specifically ibogaine um, now with with all that kind of knowledge and experience it, it was kind of a bit of a no-brainer for me having studied psychotherapy to perhaps go and try and help people in exactly the same way that, that, that i was helped um, so I set up I began counseling services about five years ago and we work with a number of the I would say the world's best plant medicine providers and I began providers um, and my job is to set people up for their experience with I began or other plant medicines um, essentially to start the process of putting intentionality integrity respect and reverence um, into the journey, um, which by dint means that the client starts to treat themselves with a bit of respect, which which hasn't happened for a very long time. If you, if you are on a on a crack pipe or on a needle, um, and then yeah, I, I help integrate after once they've had this profound rite of passage, a hero's journey, as as Joseph Campbell, the mythologist, would put it. Um, so my specialization is preset, getting people in the right frame of mind and in, in cracked open in the right ways to be able to receive this profound sacrament and then help guide them and encourage them uh, through the integration period after. And our success rate is, well, you know, in comparison to NA or IA, or detox or rehabs we, we blow them out the water completely completely blow them out the water really interested to hear your own personal backstory Anders because you just mentioned there what, what we're talking 20 25 years of addiction yeah. and struggling yeah. for you can you talk us through what substances you were using how bad it got and what what kind of sparks your turnaround right I mean I, I think my first my first addiction uh, was misery um, and not feeling good enough and, you know, feeling displaced and, you know, looking outside myself to, to, to fill that void in my chest. You know, I, I did that in a number of ways, you know, from joining the French Foreign Legion, they aged 18, um, you know, desperate to find a narrative of ownership, desperate to find out who I was. Um, and that, uh, that didn't work. Um, and then, you know, a lot of weed smoking where I, I kind of just, you know, wasted years and years of my life. And then eventually, you know, I, I found cocaine and cocaine. When I first picked it up, there's there's no one in no uncertain terms. I think it saved my life. Uh, it worked for me. It, it was a perfectly intelligent and acceptable adaptive response to the pain I was in. Um, and it worked very well for three, four, five years. Um, and then rather than me opening a door to a better place through the use of cocaine, that, that door became a revolving door quite quickly. Mm. And, and the cocaine started using me and it, and it started costing me more than money. You know, it started costing me relationships and things like that. And progressively, um, I tried everything to, to, to get off the coke from, you know, Know, new relationships to, to new jobs. I, I always felt that 
oh, if, if, if I only was going out with this girl, everything would be, be fine. If I only moved to a different postcode, everything would be fine. If I only moved abroad, everything would be fine. Um, and of course, everything that I tried to fill the void inside my, my chest failed in, in quite a spectacular way. You know, the real me always caught up on the aeroplane behind. Um, and then, you know, I went in and out of rehabs, re in and out of detoxes. I had probably eight or nine sponsors in NA and AA, and I was in and out the rooms, really, really struggling with my, my addictions. And, you know, my addictions, they did end up on some much harder stuff. I ended up on crack. Um, and that's a pretty frightening place to be. Um, and, you know, I was on it for a very, 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 very long time. And, you know, it completely took me. Um, you know, I was isolating in a small room on my own, not wishing to partake in society or life in any way, um, hating myself, wanting to die. And all I could do was light the pipe. Um, so that's kind of, you know, my, my story there is, you know, 20, 20 odd years of really, really fighting really hard to get off the drugs. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I was always looking in the wrong way at places. I was always looking externally to get fixed. Either somebody or some job or some um, amazing sort of step four or something like that would save me. Uh, it never did. You know, it wasn't until I did Ibogaine and Ibogaine in many ways forced me to look inside and, and look for that kind of rejected lost child that I had buried many, many, many years ago to be able to survive the environment I was in when I was growing up, where I was, you know, bullied and shouted at and subjugated and demeaned. Um, and what happens to a child who is, is being brought up in that type of environment, what they do is um, they say, well, you know, I, I don't want to show how much I'm hurting. I don't want to show how emotional I am. So I'm going to become an actor. And they take on this role and, and they start living this role. And to do that, they have to reject their sensitive, authentic, frightened, vulnerable self have to deny that part of our psyche to be able to become that actor. So for me, I think recovery is about building that relationship with the rejected part of your psyche, the rejected self, the rejected inner child. Um, and when we do that, some amazing things happen really quickly. To do that in conjunction with plant medicines, which break down the defenses, allow you to look at the cultural, societal and familial narratives that have perhaps forged you into something inauthentic. Um, you know, the, the recovery is fantastically quick. Um, I mean, I'm now six, seven years since I last used and life is quite amazing as a result of it i would have never dreamt that but had i not found ivy again i'm pretty sure i'd be dead by now we have experts like dr gabor mati who yeah. talk about how childhood trauma is often at the root of many addictions and I, I believe that's what you're saying as well. You're singing from the same hymn sheet. Absolutely. And, and the thing is, what's very interesting about that, that a lot of trauma is so completely normalized within Western culture and Western society that we actually don't even see that maybe we're traumatizing our children. Um, to give you a really pithy example of how sort of cultural conditioning can start to make somebody feel less than and not good enough is that I have a five-year-old daughter who's in the first year at school <coughs> and she's admittedly very young for her age and so the teachers have come to us and said to us well you know we think she's ADHD she doesn't want to sit down 
she uh, and listen she wants to play i mean and she's just turned five um so already there's this kind of idea that she's not feeling good enough because the teachers are telling her to sit down and she comes back and tells me that she's naughty. Now, this is not a narrative she should be holding about herself age five. So this is kind of, but that's endemic and very, very, very normal within our society. And then of course we have all of these expressions like pull your socks up, big girls don't cry or big boys don't cry. You know, these are, quite sort of subjugating demeaning things to say to a child in many ways because it's saying well i don't like you the way you are i want you to be something else now if a child grows up with a sense of not being liked for who they are and thinking that they should be something else they will grow up to feel very very inauthentic they will grow up to have a great big gaping hole in their chest which needs to be filled by something and, you know, we look outside ourselves because, you know, media and marketing in this world is you're not good enough unless you have a flat stomach. You're not good enough unless you're driving a Lexus. You're not good enough unless you've got these Nikes, et cetera, et cetera. So in many ways, we're taught not to have a relationship with ourselves. We're taught at a cultural level to look outside ourselves to fix ourselves the whole time. Plant medicines are completely the opposite. <laughs> you take a plant medicine, it's about looking inside yourself, looking in at your fears to be able to start healing. Tell us about your first journey with Ive again. I'm, I'm intrigued to hear what it showed you and what you had to learn. Well, I, I mean, I, I was incredibly lucky. I, I had a fantastic, uh, empathetic, knowledgeable experienced provider who, who gave me my Ibogaine. And I'll mention his name. His, his, his name is Paul Featherston, um, though he doesn't work anymore. And um, I mean, Paul actually counseled my Ibogaine treatment on the night before I was about to do it. And he, he felt that I wasn't ready. Um, and even though that destroyed me at the time, I I did it. I do realize that there was great, great sense in delaying my, my treatment until I was going in with a sense of humility as opposed to a sense of entitlement. And what I mean by that is that sense of entitlement goes back to the cultural societal narratives I was talking about earlier. I'm paying you to give me something. I want it to fix me. Mm. Um, he was saying, no, I'm, I'm giving you something that will help you fix yourself. But without you putting self-agency and integrity and intention into that process, it's not going to work. And I think this is a very, very, very important thing to talk about when it comes to plant medicines. Intentionality and integrity, getting into the right headspace, doing the work before you take the medicines is incredibly important. Um, you know, we, wanna, we want our clients to be opened up to the medicine before they take it. Um, let's not treat it like a bottle of hair shampoo that you go in and you buy and you use and expect great results. It's not going to happen that way. With the help of these plant medicines and Ibogaine, what we're trying to do is break down those historical narratives of family and culture and society and religion. And we need to break those down into their, to see how they're not serving you perhaps particularly well. Um, but they might be shame inducing. They make, might make you feel less than. Once you've done that, you can open yourself up to creating a narrative that you have ownership of and you feel comfortable of. And um, why does I begin work where the likes of methadone, some detox centres, some other other mainstream methods we've got of treating addictions? Why but is I begin more effective than those? Yeah, completely. Because what it can do is after a single flood dose of Ibogaine, you can be withdrawal three in a matter of 24 hours. No clucking, no cold turkey. You get restored to your pre-addicted state. 
but by the same token, if you don't deal with the reasons why you went into addiction in the first place, don't bother. Mm. Really, don't bother. Um, looking for that quick fix, looking for that magic bullet. You're not going to wake up as George Clooney or Uma Thurman after taking Ibogaine. It doesn't do that. You wake up as yourself. And unless you are willing to change the narratives about yourself, those, you know... <laughs> Let, let's put it this way. I mean, the, the problem is never the drugs. The coke or the heroin is never really the problem. They're the symptom of the problem. And the problem is always about your relationship with self. But I do think we have a moral responsibility that if we are helping people detox from their heroin addiction or opiate addiction or crack cocaine addiction or whatever, if we're helping them get off that, um, and we're putting them to a pre-addicted state, if we don't look at the psychology behind why they're using in the first place and the trauma, we're doing them a tremendous disservice, and we're doing the medicine a tremendous disservice as well. One of the Ibogaine treatment facilities that Anders works hand in hand with is Inner Realms Centre in Vancouver. Downtown Vancouver is described as the ground zero for addiction, as there has been a long horrendous problem with the people addicted to heroin, crack cocaine, fentanyl and other opiates. Gareth Moxie is co-founder of the Inner Realm Centre, guiding drug addicts through an Ibogaine detox and healing experience. Gareth appeared in the 2019 award-winning documentary, Dozed, which followed a Canadian woman, Adrienne, who was suicidal after 20 years of being addicted to heroin. Adrienne was finally able to overcome her long-standing addiction because she healed the root cause using a combination of magic mushrooms and iboga, the plant which Ibogaine comes from. We recently interviewed Gareth to hear his expert opinion on Ibogaine and a different approach to drug addiction treatment. Ibogaine is a powerful addiction interrupter um, and can be used for uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, different addictions and uh, behaviours, um, but our, our forte is um, opiates. You know, that's kind of our specialty. And a lot of people do actually come to Ibogaine um, because of opiate dependency. And, you know, using Ibogaine, we can... Uh, we can get people off of opiates relatively pain-free. Um, and the, the main thing that I really find that's um, um, so special about it is that it fills in, uh, apart from, of course, getting somebody through um, um, acute withdrawal syndrome, um, but uh, also being able to carry them through the post-acute withdrawal syndrome, which is you know, the reason why a lot of people, even if they can get through a kick, um, will often um, relapse because of the extended... Um, post-acute withdrawal syndrome um, that people experience, you know, um, insomnia, malaise, you know, depression, anxiety, and then often people just want a breath of fresh air and they might use once and boom, they get rewired, you know, so. So Ibogaine is very good at, at carrying people through that, that kind of three month period. But Ibogaine isn't for everybody. And an Ibogaine treatment, um, you know, it, it's often touted as kind of like a magic bullet and stuff like that. And it actually can be, it can be dangerous if it's not really, in, it, it can be dangerous when using the, the substance, but also there's a lot of danger involved around Ibogaine um, for follow-up. You know, after somebody's gone through an Ibogaine treatment, they are opiate naive, essentially. Their, their body doesn't recognize opiates. So, I mean, everybody's tolerance is is uh, greatly changed once somebody goes through a period of being um, abstinent from opiates. Uh, but with ibogaine, it really scrubs it back. So it's that you you know it's kind of like taking opiates for the first time. Now then, um, should that happen to somebody that's being uh, brought back into the wrong environment? Well, then they're really at high risk of overdose. You know, so so from my perspective, it's not just about like giving somebody ibogaine, which is often how it's been. You know banded around in the past and and when i first started working with it i was kind of a bit of an, an ibogaine evangelist you know it was, um which now I, I i tend to use it more as um 
uh, as a tool um, for detox and recovery in together in conjunction with other modalities. Um, like I always have my um, people work with Anders, um, you know, so it's, uh, uh, because, you know, with the Ibogaine, it's not like a, a Band-Aid. It's more about getting to the root causes of the addiction in the first place. You know, so I prefer that that whole process to be guided with somebody like Anders, you know, and then also um, aftercare. You know, I, I say to people, it's all very well taking Ibogaine, game, but what the fuck are you going to do with it? You know, so it's important that that people are, are you know, trying to utilize the, the the more tools and modalities that they can in order to have a successful treatment. You know, it's not just the Ibogaine. game. It's not really understood exactly what's going on and, and why um, it does what it does, but it can provide um, a great deal of intro introspection and a lot of quote unquote truth about ourselves and our situation might be served up to us on a plate, you know, mm -hmm. and um, which is part of the healing um, process. Like I began in a boga, you know, some people take it for not recreational purposes you know um but most people most of the people i work with um come for it come to it for a detox purposes you know um so it's not the sort of thing you'd get together with some friends and, hey you want to take to my boga this weekend you know um because it can be you know um yeah it can be harsh mm -hmm. the stern father as they say and it has quite a um, uh, a stern male energy to it, you know. Um, but often in addiction, that's kind of what we need. And so, um, yeah, it's a, and it's a powerful addiction interrupter. So what it does is it 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 kind of like gets the monkey off people's back, you know. And for a lot of people, that might be the first time that the monkey has been off the back since they started taking drugs. You know, if people have that kind of connection, especially with something like opiates, you know, that kind of close connection with that compound for what it can offer, you know, that sense of security, the warm hug kind of thing, you know, so um, that, that's a powerful thing for some people. And working with the Ibogaine might be the first time that they've actually been able to let that go, you know, that feeling or that dependency. And so... Um, and if you use a lot of Ibogaine, like I, I do, then that generally holds people for about three months powerfully, you know, and, and, um, that's why it's important to get people to go to aftercare. You know, I don't, I don't like to treat somebody, especially a heavy opiate user, you know, treat them and go, you know, and then send them back to their drug using surroundings. You know, in, in some ways it's, it's kind of, we are the... In layman's terms, you could look at addiction as like, you know, a broken leg. And what happens here is that we reset the leg. And, 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 but the aftercare is the plaster paris that goes around it, you know, and the, and the working with Anders is also a, a key component of all of that, you know, instead of us like fixing a leg and then going, okay, don't run too fast. You know, the whole thing's a process, you know, so. And at the end of my using, I, I was isolating in a very, very small room. Um, I, I, I was very, very thin. I was very pale. Um, you know, I'd kind of been abusing myself for many, many, many years. And I just hated myself. I had an appalling um, opinion of myself. Um, and I would be smoking crack, lying on the floor, crying as the walls to my room are closing in on me and the ceiling's coming down and my world is gradually getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I'm feeling that need to somehow escape this awful, awful feeling. Um, 
and while I'm there, I'm always aware that my grandparents were watching me, you know, who'd all passed on. And, and, you know, every time I thought about my grandparents, who were the only ones who could see me in my head, abusing myself the way that I was, um, I, I used to be, oh, no. I, I used to get, you know, that sense of shame for who I'd become uh, was so profound. And then, you know, I took the Ivy game and one of the first, first lot of people I meet are my grandparents and they're all dressed in their Sunday finery. And I'm thinking, God, oh, you know, they look fantastic. Who are they going to meet? Must be somebody important. And actually they'd come to meet me in my journey. And suddenly that overwhelming sense of shame started flooding into me again. I thought, oh, this is a fantastic opportunity to just apologize, to get down on my knees and say, I'm sorry. And I got down on my knee. And before the words came out of my mouth, my, my grandfather had put his hand on, on, on my head and went, shh, it's okay. This is the journey you had to make. You've made no mistakes. And thank you for saving us. And in that moment... I was able to put this metaphorical rock sack of shame, which I'd been carrying for 20, 25 years. And I've got to say, that's the main thing I used on is a shame narrative. Anytime I knew, felt shame, you know, the only way I could stop that feeling was to get on the pipe. Um, but that rock sack of shame had been put down immediately. And in my eyes, you know, have, had I tried to achieve that in traditional psychotherapy <laughs> with a client, how many years? How many years? And it was done by the Ibogaine in, in, you know, kind of instantly for me. You know, it felt like probably 30 seconds lesson. Um, and it was one of the lessons I walked away with that I remembered. And I do believe that when you do the Ibogaine experience and your gifted visions, the ones what you remember are the ones that you need to be kind of working on and understanding and, and integrating and working through. Um, you know, I began as a, is a brutal, but fantastically honest, paternal, paternal, not patriarchal, paternal um, spirit. It tells you straight what is wrong with you. Um, it does it in a very direct way as well. There's no escaping that. Um, and so then, you know, if you do the Ibogaine journey and you don't return to the environment where you're going to be triggered too quickly um, and you give yourself a little bit of time to recover, um, to integrate what's happened during your Ibogaine experience, you know, the efficacy of an ibogaine treatment just blows all other modalities out of the water a high dose ibogaine is like being blown open kaboom and so it's really the opposite end of the scale from where the average opiate um user likes to reside and so the, my method is much more gradual, it's much safer, but it's much longer. And it means that people have to engage with the medicine a lot more, which is in some respects more difficult. But at the same time, you know, Ibogaine can be very appealing to drug users. Oh, I'm going to take this drug to get off that drug, you know, and, and especially with the younger ones. And I've dealt with quite a few of them, you know, um, now with the way I work, it's uh, people have to be more prepared to do the work because it's a day in day out thing, you know, and that can be quite grueling having your ass served up to you on a plate every day with all of your imperfections and stuff. How long do you work with people on average? Um, for an opiate detox, fourteen days. Fourteen. Now, so the the way I work, um, I feel that will be. The way, is the way that Ibogaine will be used in the future for opiates in a, in a medical way, you know, because I know that the powers that be don't like um, something that's medically risky. And so from their perspective, like, oh, it's much safer to just have you on Spoxone and methadone, you know, um, and they don't like tripping either, the powers that be. Oh, it's going to cause you to trip, you know. I mean, they'll tolerate a little bit of ketamine in anesthesia and stuff, but 
generally speaking, they don't like uh, mind altering things and stuff that they can't put their finger on, you know, do you know what I mean? Or, this is because of this and that. And so it's totally out of there, you know, but the way I work is um, in low dose. And so what happens is that people take a certain amount of um, ibogaine in the day instead of an opiate dose. And then in the afternoon, they get put back on morphine. You, you sounded quite confident there that at some point this will be used for, for addiction. Do you, do you think that will happen? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be done in a flood dose either. You know, um, I had somebody wor working with me not so long ago that, for cocaine and his heart rate was low. And uh, Ibogaine also lowers the heart rate and um, uh, systolic and diastolic. So there's, there's physiology that happens with Ibogaine. And so I just couldn't give him the, the kind of doses that I wanted to. But it didn't matter. I, we just worked in those low doses and he stayed for 11 days. And um, that was back in early spring. And he still has no compulsion to use cocaine. Somebody comes to me and they don't have a good plan. I won't treat them. Doesn't have to be, you know, in an ideal world where we didn't have to worry about resources, i.e. money then, um, yeah, it would be, oh, okay, you come and stay with me for two weeks. You know, I'll load you up with Ibogaine. Ibogaine will be coming out of your ears. Um, and then, you know, you'd be chatting with, with Anders or uh, uh, another um, drug and alcohol counsellor, um, you know, an Ibogaine drug and al alcohol counsellor, um, and then going off to um, an, an Ibogaine aftercare facility. You know, the worst, the worst place you could really send somebody after an Ibogaine treatment is to go hang out with some people at a rehab that haven't taken Ibogaine because they're in two different places. Do you know what I mean? I've been through um, traditional rehab and, you know, we sat around and talked war stories, drank coffee, smoked cigarettes. It was fucking useless, quite honestly, I, I, I thought at the time. And, and, and that's what I feel a lot of our people feel anyhow. Because most people, by the time you get to Ibogaine, have tried this way, that way, and every other which way, you know. But and so, and so, traditional rehab isn't isn't such a great idea. So, you know, uh, there are aftercare facilities, or I say to to some of my people, you go stay on Uncle Bill, Bill's farm in Saskatchewan. It doesn't really matter as long as you're away from your triggers and you're away from the temptations of drugs and you're in positive, supported environment, you know. So, I, you know, I, 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 I want to work on, I, I feel that in the future that we'll have a different, we'll, a different approach around this. And I begin, because it costs so much as a society to deal with addiction. If you want to understand addiction, you can't look at what's wrong with the addiction. You have to look at what's right about it. In other words, what is the person getting from the addiction? What are they getting that otherwise they don't have? And what addicts get are relief from, us, from pain. What they get is a sense of peace, a sense of control, um, a sense of calmness, very, very temporarily. And the question is, why are these qualities missing from their lives? What happened to them? Now, if you look at the drugs like heroin, like morphine, like codeine, um, if you look at uh, cocaine, if you look at alcohol, these are all painkillers. One way or another, they all soothe pain. And that's what the real question in addiction is not why the addiction, but why the pain.